Brothers and sisters, uh, this evening we are going to have a thematic discussion about Surah and Nisa, Ayahs 131 through 137. And it, this is a very uh, significant Surah. Uh, in that, and particularly these ayahs, 131 through 137, the period of revelation of these ayahs were during the first three, fourth, and the early fifth year of the hijra of the Prophet Muhammad And when we look into the Sunnah and the Sirah during this particular time, we find that this was a time when the Prophet Muhammad was developing his ummah. As a matter of fact, Ummah and the concept of Ummah was established after the Hijra, because before that particular time, the loyalties and the allegiance of all of the Arabs was basically to their tribe. But now we had members from various tribes and not even belonging to Arab, Arab tribes who were following the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad And this was based on his uh, being the messenger of Allah and not be, because of his being uh, from the Dani Hashem or the Quraysh. So this concept of Umar and the establishment of the state was developed during these early years in Medina. And the Prophet Sallallahu during this time was uh, having ayahs revealed to him from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that address many of the social concerns and the issues that were confronting this young community uh, in Medina. And so when we look at starting with Ayah 131, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins uh, addressing, well, <coughs> well, <coughs> excuse me. Wallahi mafi asamawati wa mafi al <clears throat> to Allah belongs all things in the heavens and in the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually responding that uh, the questions that were addressed in earlier ayahs of the surah about women, about marriage, and about orphans. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is establishing this ayah that no matter what kind of, um, what we as Muslims, what we come to in addressing divorce issues and marriage and separation and, and how we treat orphans, that Allah establishes that he is the one who owns everything in the heavens and the earth. To him belongs everything. So it's nonsensical for us as human beings to think that every, anything that we have, that we can deny the risk, the provision, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, uh, that, that he gives to us, that we're not in control of anything as it relates to our uh, daily provision and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls this. And then this next ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to describe how to Allah belongs all things in the heavens and the earth uh, and, and reminds the believers in this new community in Medina, that the same uh, instructions that were given to previous Ummah, particularly members of the Akal Kitab, the Christians and the Jews, that these same instructions were given uh, to, the, uh, to the believers in Medina, and that the success of the believers would only come about um, actually the being mutaki, being having the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without this particular love and reverence and fear of Allah, then the instructions, the social guidelines that Allah establishes for this ummah uh, cannot be successfully uh, put into place. They cannot be successfully practiced if that fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not there. So Allah reminds the Ummah first that even in having these guidelines, that unless and until 
we accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our Lord, as our Lord, uh, then we will not be successful uh, in implementing any of these guidelines. This next uh, ayah, this ayah 133, uh, goes on to give an even stronger warning to the Ummah at this stage. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to remind the Ummah that if it were his will, he could actually destroy everyone and all mankind and create another race that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need for us as human beings to be his worshipers. If we choose not to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that he commands us to do, and if we choose not to follow his guidelines, Allah reminded this ummah and reminded mankind that he would just has the ability, the capacity to just destroy us and start all over with an entirely different creation. In Ayah 134, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that having desires that exceeds the limits that have been established in the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and in the Quran, that having desires exceeding these limits uh, is something that is really not for the benefit of us as human beings, because Allah reminds in this ayah 134 that he is the one who provides the rewards and the provisions, and that he actually uh, controls not only this dunya, but he controls what it is that we will get or not get in the akhira. This fit, uh, this 135th ayah is an ayah that I want to spend just a few more moments talking about. It's a very important ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout this address uh, of these few ayahs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing uh, the believers. Ya ladina amanu. That Allah is addressing those who are committed and convicted to this deen, that to, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to address a community as mu'minun, at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is recognizing that the persons being addressed, that this, this uh, directive is for those who are truly committed to this deen al haq this deen of truth. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this 135th ayah addresses this new ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and gives this ummah a responsibility that had not been given to any other ummah prior to the establishment of this the mission of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi And that particular mission, that particular role was that of being standard bearers for justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in commanding that we establish justice and do right on the earth, gave the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the uh, unique duty and responsibility and the unique role of being those who are standard bearers for justice, standing out firmly for that which is just. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a standard that has been established for the believers of this ummah that is unlike any other ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us, each and every one of us, individually and collectively, to not only uh, follow the normal course of, of enacting or trying to enact justice in our personal and collective lives. But in this instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding that we have such a high standard that the justice that we expect to implement and try to implement should have no consider consideration whether it's going against us as individuals, whether it's going against our parents, whether it's going against other relatives and loved ones, whether the justice that's needed at this particular time 
is actually going against a person who is rich, a person who is poor, that it makes no difference that the standard of justice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has invested this ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu with, the measure by which justice is established in a society of believers following the, the surah and sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi is that no personal considerations would interfere with our capacity, our inclination, our ability to establish justice in the land, in the society. This is a very unique form of justice. It was something that those who were with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were very unaccustomed to. As I mentioned earlier, this was a tribal-based society. And so might made right. And whatever the person's um, uh, identity was, but tribe in particular that they belonged to, who were those powerful people of the tribe who could defend them? That these were considerations that brought about the attempt to dispense justice in the pre-Islamic days uh, in the Jahiliya period of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But now that this Ummah was established as a city-state in Medina, now the standard of justice was that no matter who may be uh, the, the rights may go against uh, whoever is not found that they have uh, won, say, in some kind of judgment, no matter whether it's the person, their parents, or whoever it may be, that our standard for justice is to establish this without any consideration of whether or not we or our loved ones or rich or poor will personally benefit benefit. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in commanding us to take this stand uh, for justice uh, has established not just for a time lock period of the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu but for all time. And so as Muslims living in the society in which we live today, for Muslims worldwide, we are obligated by this divine mandate to take a stand for justice to be standard bearers, not just be reflective of an honest or sincere person, but to show the society, to show those around us what it means to establish a God-fearing society, to make judgments and determinations about the appropriation of goods and services and what's right and what's wrong not based on the might of a particular group, but based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has subscribed for all of us uh, to, to follow by. Brothers and sisters, this standard of justice is a standard that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this ummah as an amana. It is a trust. It is a trust that you and I uh, can take the responsibility of trying to effect and do the things that we know that we should be doing uh, because of this unique trust that the Lord Supreme Wata has given us, or we can ignore and continue to contribute to the, the, the injustice and the inequality that exists in the society today. This particular eye <clears throat> inspires me to look around and try to analyze what are those pressure points? What are those issues in the society in which we live today that we should and that we must be involved, involved with? And this uh, last election, uh, just the election just yesterday, as a matter of fact, perhaps pointed out better than anything else that this nation is crying out for uh, someone, some groups of people, and I say for the believers of this ummah to step forward and to try to help rectify and to show a divine solution to hideous problems, social issues 
like the problems of racism uh, that we have seen so flaunted and so uh, encouraged uh, throughout this last electoral cycle. The racism that has plagued this nation has often been referred to as America's original sin. And when we as Muslims sit and feel that because there are certain benefits that we can derive from being in this country and just keeping our mouths closed and not causing any problems or any issue amongst the population, then we are guilty of not discharging the responsibilities that we have to be that standard bearer of justice in society. Brothers and sisters, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, uh, has, I'm sorry, has, has, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us uh, to take stands. Uh, and I just want to give just a couple of other quick examples of how this translates uh, from the pages of the Quran, from the Sirah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to the times in which we live today. Uh, one very clear example is that when we look <clears throat> at the issues uh, that are plaguing the society, and we find whether we're talking about Islamophobia, whether we're talking about as another form of racism, uh, whether we're talking about mass incarceration, uh, whatever it is that we are um, uh, that we're confronted with in the society, oftentimes we find that the Muslims lag far behind in being vocal um, opponents and vocal advocates for justice in the society that we're in. We, it's not enough for us individually to just say, well, I'm not contributing uh, consciously and deliberately to the wrongs that are going on in this society. As Muslims, we are obligated by this command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take stands ourselves, to get involved in those things that would help bring about equity and justice and equality for other citizens uh, in this country and for our community. This nation is a nation of immigrants. We find today that as our immigrant uh, brothers and sisters, primarily from Honduras, continue their trek to the Mexican border with the intent of trying to get asylum here in the United States. As a Muslim community with the majority of, of us being non-American born Muslims, uh, we have a duty and responsibility to reach out to help our brothers and sisters who are in this caravan. And I'm just using this by way of example. I'm not saying uh, necessarily specifically we should be limited in our social justice efforts. We should start, of course, in our own homes. We should be those like uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when Aisha radiallahu anha was asked about the behavior of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his character, she responded that it was the Quran. So in our own households, we should be those first and foremost who are standard bearers for justice. We should be those who to our children, uh, to our loved ones, to our mothers, to our fathers, uh, to the neighbors and co-workers, that taking a stand is a very practical thing. And it can be as simple uh, in taking a stand for what is right and being uh, an example, the standard bearer for justice, and not listening to uh, jokes about individuals or groups of people that would offend those people if they were present to hear what was being said about them. It can be as simple as stopping uh, bullying, which is such a, a, a horrendous problem in our public schools here in the United States today. Uh, we can take a stand in many different kinds of ways, but what we and what I'm suggesting 
what I'm imploring us to understand is that we should not just be those people who will tell others about the theological uh, purity of the religion of Islam. This is very important. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us an additional, very unique and important role and responsibility, and that is to be the standard bearers for justice uh, here in the United States. And so uh, these next few ayahs, uh, ayah 136 and one, ayahs 136 and 137, um, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again is just reminding us uh, to believe in him, to believe in Allah, to believe in uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the Quran, uh, that these are scriptures uh, that were that that this scripture and that those that were revealed prior to the revelation of the Quran are also books that we should believe in. Of course, believing uh, in the angels, believing in the hereafter, uh, believing in all of these things will put us in a position. It will just position us to be able to develop the believing spirit, the God-fearing spirit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires has as a prerequisite for us being able to carry out this responsibility and duty of being standard bearers for justice in the society in which we live. And this 37th uh, ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions and references those people who, for whatever reason, find the adherence to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu something that is too burdensome or for whatever reason uh, will leave the actual uh, practice of the faith and then come back. And then something, some experience happens in their lives and they leave again and come back. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it clear that at a particular point that's only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah will seal their fate and hence they will not be able uh, return, to return to the practice of this deen. So uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, encapsulating what has been said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and giving the social guidance and instruction that he gave to this Ummah, keeping in mind that the earliest revelations of the Quran, and these were not uh, in that particular category, but when we look at the Meccan surahs and these earliest revelations, we can see very clearly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasized social ills of the Arabian and the Meccan society in some of the earliest of revelations. One of the earliest issues, and of course, this is after Tawheed, and this is after uh, uh, the Akra, but one of the earliest uh, prohibitions that was mentioned in the Quran, mentioned in the very early revelations, was that of killing female children, this uh, uh, infanticide. Uh, and as you and I know, that the Arabs of the Hejaz, were inclined that when they had daughters, they would have to make the choice and decision whether they would bury the child alive, not at birth, but when she actually got three, four, five years old. Uh, there was a designated place outside of Mecca where they would go and bury these young girls because of the shame that they felt, because of the dishonor that had been attributed to females at the time. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the earliest of rev revelations address this hideous practice amongst the Jahiliya Arabs at that particular time. There's so many other issues like the um, oppression of the orphans and taking orphans money, the mistreatment of women in general. These were all issues that the cheating in business, these were ills of the society that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed 
in the earliest days of the revelation of the Quran. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, recited these ayahs, these revelations, to those who would listen to him at that time, pointing out that if you believe in a creator, if you believe in a, uh, a, a life force, a, 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 just a alcoholic, if you believe in a creator, then you have to, uh, that it was inconsistent to say that you believe in God and to do such ungodly things like burying daughters and cheating and having such a racist attitude about those who were of a different race, of a different tribe, uh, having a different attitude about those who did not have wealth in the society. The early revelations of the Quran and the practices of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, were very inspiring and encouraging and even mandating that even today and up until that we as living in whatever society we in and for us here in the United States that we take a stand and point out First, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how important it is to, to govern our, our actions by what Allah has revealed. But simultaneously, as we are pointing these things out, Allah has given us as an ummah of Muhammad وسلم, a new role in uh, the history of faith communities, a new role and that is to be representatives as witnesses to a law for justice and what is right. That it's not just taking a stand uh, ourselves for ourselves, but taking a stand as witnesses to and for a law for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as we read these ayahs from Quran, uh, I and ask myself, I employ and put a responsibility on myself, and I ask that you do likewise to read these ayahs, to read this entire surah with an understanding that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was emphasizing in these very early days of how to craft a human society based not on uh, the, the, the wants or desires of any particular group or class of people, but to base a society on the guidance of the creator. Uh, I'll, I'll pause, I, I want to make just one more point here and I'll pause and see if there are any questions or comments to be had. And uh, I'll, I'll end with this particular example of how the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would take a stand for that which is right in the earliest days of Islam, even before the revelation of these particular ayahs. And I'll give this just one example. Uh, there was a merchant who came to Mecca to sell his goods. And while he was there selling his goods, Abu Jal saw that he had quite a few things that Abu Jal actually wanted. And so Abu Jal approached the man and was close to the Hajj season. And Abu Jal approached the man and told him that if you sell all of your goods to me, then you won't have to sell things throughout the highs. You can just be guaranteed that you get your money and you'll sell everything and uh, you'll be happy and I'll be happy. So just give me a price and I'll purchase everything that you have. And the man gave Abu Jal a price. Abu Jal agreed to the price. And then he told the man, well, when the Hajj is over, after I sell these things, I'll give you your money. When the Hajj was over, Abu Jal refused to pay the man. The man began to go around asking the leaders of the Quraysh to help him retrieve his property, his goods, his merchandise, and explain to them what Abu Jal had done. Finally, these leaders felt that let's have a good joke. And what they decided to do was to say, well, we'll send you to a man who can get your property back for you. Go find Muhammad in the Abdullah. He will get your property. 
Abel Jal, of course, was probably the greatest arch enemy of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu during uh, Abu Jal's lifetime and during the prophetic life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And so the Quraysh leaders thought this was a joke. This was funny. This was something they could get a laugh on. And so when the man went and found the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and this is in the, the days of the Meccan phase of the Islamic movement under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And so the Muslims were in a very weak state. Uh, Muslims were being tortured to death and all of these things. But the Prophet Sallallahu immediately got up from what he was doing and went to Abu Jal and insisted, knocked on his door and insisted that Abu Jal return his goods. Uh, the Quraysh leaders were standing around thinking they would get a good laugh. A good laugh. But to, much to their surprise, Abu Jal went into his house, retrieved all of the man's property, gave him his property, gave him the money. Uh, from the sale that he had done of his property, and the excuse me, and the man was satisfied. And so, when the man left with his goods, and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left Abu Jahl's house, the Meccan leaders asked Abu Jahl, "Why did you do this?" And of course, he responded, "I had this this vicious-looking camel over my shoulder. I thought he was going to eat me up." But the point of this is that even in the weakest phase of the Islamic movement in Mecca under the leadership of Muhammad ibn Abdullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not hesitate to take a stand uh, for justice, to try to bring about justice for this man who had been cheated by his arch enemy. He was not at a position where he had thousands at his disposal uh, as an army that he had uh, Hamza, or he had Omar ibn al-Qatab, or he had others who could protect him and to protect that small group of Muslims at that time. But he did not hesitate. So social standing up for social justice and right is a hallmark of this faith. It's unfortunate that throughout the world today that we see so few examples of how Muslim nations or how groups of Muslims or individual Muslims uh, reflect the high ideals of justice that have been established uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this ummah in the Quran and established in the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it is imperative that we um, uh, that we take Islam in its fullest and that we discharge the responsibilities uh, that we are responsible uh, for and for the purpose of this discussion, one of them being uh, taking very, uh, if necessary, public, uh, but taking a stand for justice and what is right according uh, to the, the Sunnah uh, of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and according uh, to the Quran uh, revealed by the Prophet Muhammad, uh, re revealed by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, um, okay. So, do we have any questions or? Are there any questions or any comments? Yes. Um, yes, inshallah. I, um, Zakala Khair Imam. Um, you didn't get a chance to introduce since the beginning. So, this is Imam Khalid Greg, um, who is the editor uh, um, of the Message Magazine and also the vice president of ICNN. Um, Alhamdulillah. Um, so, the first question that we have um, is that um, can you highlight some of the practical steps that an individual can take? Um, to implement some of these high ideals, just yeah, I, I think there are. Um, I think we can start with saying that one of the reasons why Muslims and others don't take positions when they know something is wrong and they they feel it's wrong, they know it's wrong, they see it's wrong, uh, is uh, peer pressure. 
it's the kind of peer pressure in a society like in the United States, where it's almost a herd instinct that when there's a particular um, um, trend that is happening, why, whether it's in social media or just in the society in general, that people have difficulty, and we as Muslims oftentimes have difficulty uh, breaking from the trend, taking stands that go against the norm. Uh, what is not popular, oftentimes we shy away from, from doing these things. So I think it begins by things as simple on an individual level. It's not telling everybody to be a Malcolm X uh, who was perhaps, uh, in my humble opinion, he was one of the most um, influential and impactful uh, Muslims to be grown on American soil, to, to, to be born on American soil and to grow up in this country, uh, that Malcolm was noted for uh, speaking truth to power. And he said things that many of us would not have the courage to say, even though they were true. Uh, and over the years, I think that much of what he said is, is, is showing that it was true. Uh, so everybody's not required to take to be like that, to take a stand. It could be as simple as when your coworker is telling you uh, a joke that's based in racism, and you tell that person that they should not be saying this, that this is this is racist. Uh, if they're telling a joke about someone based on a classism, that a person is wearing certain clothing and they're joking at them because of the clothing that they wear and this is all that they have. Uh, taking a stand for what's right and just can be as simple as pointing out to the person that what they're saying is wrong. And as we are obligated not to listen to this kind of poison, uh, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is clear, don't use your ears for, and I'm paraphrasing, for receptacles for garbage. And so, uh, it doesn't mean that we have to be out on the street corner. We have to be in a protest if we feel comfortable in doing this. And I don't mean total comfort because in order to take any stand for justice, we have to be a little out of our comfort zone. I think it's also important that we use whatever resources uh, that we have to try to uh, bring about, I mean, let me give you an example. I was in a city in the United States recently, and I learned of a group of Muslims uh, that was spearheaded by a Muslim sister. Uh, and this group of Muslims looked at the academic, uh, they looked at the academic achievement level of many inner city Muslim youth and they decided that what they would do was to try to get scholarships so they could try to upgrade their education. But what ended up happening, they realized that the children had been educated in such poor schools that they were not academically ready to be in, in uh, some of the Muslim schools and uh, Muslim schools in the city in particular. So what they did was to get, raise money, pay tuition for a large number of these children and it just didn't work out for most of these kids. So what they did, they started more tutorial work and working with the children on weekends and the children graduated from this and uh, went into the Muslim schools and really did wonderfully. So rather than uh, just observing and recognizing that, yeah, these kids have bad education and not doing anything about it, but talking about them in a negative kind of way, they took the resources that they had, they took their desire to want to do something right, to try to help correct some generational wrongs that had been done against this population of people in this country, and they did something about it. So I think we just need to be on the lookout for, um, you know, you know, we, we have this responsibility uh, promoting and joining right and forbidding wrong. Sometimes forbidding wrong may, is more difficult for most of us to do. But promoting right is, is, is not. That's an easy thing to do, it just requires a commitment. 
We only have a couple of minutes. Um, so the last question that I wanted to ask was, can justice be brought unless we change ourselves? Uh, no, um, it, it, it cannot. Um, it, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran that he's not going to change the condition of a people until they change that which is within themselves. Now for us as, uh, you know, uh, expiring believers, as believers, uh, we have a responsibility to do what we can even though we may not be perfect uh, or meet that standard across the board, the standard of justice in our own households. So it means if I holler at my children, if I am mean to my grandchildren, if I'm not showing compassion for my brother or sister, does this mean that it eliminates me from other acts of doing other acts of justice? No, not at all. I think that uh, we have to come uh, as we are to this table. It's just like any other aspect of the practice of Islam. Uh, we may not have it perfected in our fast on month of Ramadan. We may not have perfected our salah, even knowing every part of our salah or making the salah on time, but we know that we're obligated to do it. And I think that we should bring the same attitude as it relates to issues of social justice, that we know that this is an essential part of this deen uh, and we have to do whatever we can uh, uh, in order to discharge this responsibility.